because when he meet uh, his eleven, he has to take like more than one month to to go close, to be friends, and to talk with the eleven. Is passed down to his family since his grand grandfather time and his his grandfather time and his uncle time and his time. He said the relationship between him and Eleven is he can't explain with a word, but living with them, you will understand them more. Logging had sustained the elephant. The people who looked after elephants, it had been the reason for having elephants in captivity and for having so many elephants in captivity since at least 1950. It, it, it's probably an exaggeration, but I like it anyway. They built the country. Thailand remain, was able to prove that it was um, a, a world power enough to be able to not be invaded, to be able to negotiate its way through life by showing, look, we can control the timber industry, we can supply these things to the rest of the world. Um, and provide a lot of income. In 89 they were still doing logging but a lot of the forest was gone um, and the old style sustainable logging of taking out three or four trees at a, of a stand of seven and then coming back to it in 90 years and taking the other three or four trees out um, had stopped and they were clear felling um, allegedly and I wasn't here there was a big big lot of rain there were floods in Bangkok but there were other political reasons. Anyway logging was banned. Elephants almost overnight were put out of work now, uh, there's a film called Kun Liang Chang, which is set up at that time. Uh, and the, one of the quotes from it is, well, what are we going to do? A mahout can't eat elephant shit. And that is true. These guys owned elephants. They looked after elephants for 3,000 years. Three and a half thousand years, they had to find ways to make a living. What I think happened, and again, I wasn't here, is they started walking back home. And when they were walking back home, if if for some reason, we, you take an elephant and walk it down the street here, from Sopurak to sometimes you take an elephant to the school, uh, people will come out and they will feed the elephant. So storekeepers will come out. It's a Buddhist thing, it's good luck to feed an elephant. That somebody saw that, the Mahouts saw that, they realized they needed a way to feed their elephant. They weren't actually necessarily thinking about, because nobody ever got rich street begging, they weren't necessarily thinking of a way to make themselves rich. They realized people will pay to feed an elephant. Now, that, I think, is how actually probably tourism started as well, in that some of the ex-logging camp owners and the first tourist camps, uh, the big ones, the trekking camps in, uh, in Chiang Mai, still to this day, Mesa, Sa, Mei Taman, that whole Mei Deng Valley, were centers of the logging industry. So the big logging camps said, well, people will pay to feed an elephant, people will pay to ride an elephant, let's see if we can keep our elephants alive, keep ourselves in business, keep ourselves having a living by bringing in tourism. The latest stop uh, of the logging in 2015 has put about four and a half thousand elephants out of work. Now there is tourism in, in Burma as well, however that's not as big as Thailand and the market is just not, e not enough to provide work for all these elephants. So lately we've seen a lot of elephants being smuggled from Burma into Thailand, sometimes onto Laos and onto China. Uh, through some laundering system. This is illegal, it should be stopped, but unfortunately um, the owners of the elephants in Burma um, don't see a way uh, to make enough money in their own country. We need some form of mass tourism to look after 3,400 elephants. Um, and if it allows the Mahout and the owner to make some money to feed that elephant and give that elephant the rest of its day off in a large piece of land, then, then it's worth it. In March this year, 100,000 more tourists arrived from China than from all of Europe put together. And Europe includes Russia, which was the third largest source market. The problem is that over the last 20 years, we've been fighting very hard in Western countries to, 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 to stop the practice of riding elephants. Um, the United States, Europe, Australia, very hard. We've been, been fighting to make people understand that riding elephants is a no-no. Elephant polo is a no-no. Where these uh, Western people now are saying, well, we're not riding elephants anymore. The Chinese take over this market. And unfortunately for the elephants, the Chinese market is a completely different one, a much tougher one. Give you an example. In the old days, people would pay 20 to $30 for a 40 minute ride on an elephant. They would sit for 40 minutes, go around the forest a little bit, 
get through some ponds so the elephant would get wet and the people as well a couple of pictures made and the elephant have a run for 40 minutes then probably 20 minutes no work could drink a bit could eat something and then have another ride with the Chinese market it's completely different these people pay only two or three dollars for a ride they only sit on that for five minutes they just want to get a selfie and a picture from distance on the elephant you know greetings from Thailand the elephant has to work much harder is in the full sun most of the day, doesn't have time to eat or drink. So actually, this awareness that we created for the Western world is actually on short term right now. Most Chinese guests are coming in on package tours. In general, even if they do care, the package tourists are not choosing their own hotel, they're not choosing their own camp. So they're just on a tour which tick, bop, tick, tick, tick. This is what we do. This is where you go. You do this time on the beach. You have that. You have this included in your tour and then the agent will arrange that and typically with that form of tourism which is probably and i don't know my facts on this one but probably the largest form of tourism worldwide and in order to make yourself cheaper than everybody else if you're looking into that market which we need to then you have to cut corners and basically they work until they drop most of the elephants eventually get sore legs arthritis uh, they get bad skin uh, they get abscesses uh, and they work until they can't work any longer. To be very honest with you, I see that most of the elephants just die working and only a few lucky ones uh, make it into rescue centers, but the majority, you know, works until they drop. The pressure on these elephants for working so much actually makes them really itchy at the end of the day they want to do something and now currently actually what i see is that more and more elephant camps are turning into more a key animal welfare project like a rescue center like uh, non-elephant rides no polo no you know no tricks uh, however i also see that lately over the last few years the amount of people that died at these elephant camps for tourists has been increasing uh, people are too easily expecting that elephants are gentle giants and they're not they can be very dangerous. They could kill you without even wanting to. In some cases, foreigners get killed. We had a Scottish man in Koh Samui a few months ago, uh, an American lady um, got killed in Chiang Mai in an elephant camp. These things happen, and it's not gonna get any, any better. When we started off, we'd say, we're using ex-logging elephants to help us in tourism. Um, and that's our excuse, if you like, for doing tourism. That excuse doesn't really stand. People are breeding tourism has now become a driving force in its own right and not necessarily a good one, which is why we need to be helping to, to make it good. But the number of elephants in Thailand in captivity is increasing at the moment, uh, partially through to through better counting techniques. So more and more elephants are being legalized, if you like. They already existed. They're being legalized. Partially, we think, being brought in from Myanmar, partially through breeding. A, a price of an elephant in Myanmar to buy an elephant is now it's a, I know a camp in Myanmar where they are renting to start they are renting government elephants to start a tourism thing they are paying something like a hundred dollars a month to rent the elephant and a hundred dollars a month upkeep that's two hundred dollars was two times twelve twenty two thousand four hundred the figure I give you here is eighteen thousand US dollars so given that there are 6,000 elephants in Myanmar and very little work for them to do and it's extremely difficult to make a living and there are there is growing demand for elephants in Thailand and they can make in some of the the not so good camps where they have to work too hard they can make up to 40,000 baht a month of course it's happening somehow you would find a way to make it happen it doesn't make sense for it not to happen um, a, they interviewed traffic I think interviewed a customs guy and he said we've let so and so I've let so and so number of elephants come through for this amount of money uh, through my border checkpoint because I'm saving money to go and see the World Cup now at the same time we find out that uh, elephants are taken from the wild still young elephants in the forests of Burma and even unfortunately in Thailand currently they're using different techniques what happens is they find a herd of elephants with one or two three babies they then surround these groups and actually use uh, sedative sedatives and, and shoot with dart guns the babies. These babies will then drop and fall asleep and then they will scare away the whole herd. In some cases the mummies and the nannies 
that take care and protect these babies will stay on. If they stay on too long, they'll be shot, they'll be killed. Pickup trucks uh, with um, special mo uh, uh, enforcement in the back can easily take a baby elephant like that on their backs. Um, usually with aluminium casing around looking like some kind of uh, soap truck, you know, a truck that brings soap and all kind of other stuff to little shops in, in the uh, rural areas. Um, the baby elephants will be dragged in there, keep them under sedation. They take them to little villages at the border, usually Karen villages, where these people have been training baby elephants for many, many years. This group uh, that does this will get about 7,000 US dollars per elephant. But once this baby elephant has been trained in a couple of weeks later, the value for this elephant goes up another three to ten thousand dollars. Then they will get a female captive elephant and get the baby to be matched with the female. Of course, you get some kind of a bond between that female who's not the real mother. Once that bond is, is, is getting very clear, the owner of this elephant will register the baby as being born from this female. And of course, to the authorities, it looks that, that they are. It gets registered and by then it's a legal captive elephant and the price for that elephant then suddenly becomes something like sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars for a baby. So this laundering basically is, is very, very lucrative for these people. You could say there's no way, some people say there's no way you can own another living soul and I to a certain extent agree with that but the paperwork says differently. They've spent a lot of money um, sometimes in their 3,500 year tradition purchasing this animal. It's more money than, to call the cost of an elephant at the moment is more money than I personally have and they are into debt for that. So they have a piece of paper that says they own it. So within the laws of the country, which, however you feel about it, you can't just take that elephant away without giving them money. If you give them money, because they've been elephant for 3,500 years, they buy another elephant. So that's problem number one. And the idea of releasing them, there are projects that have worked and experimented on releasing elephants back into the wild. Uh, the, the most recent ongoing one is the Elephant Reintroduction Foundation in, uh, in two sites here in Thailand. Um, I think for captive elephants, some captive elephants, with a nice and scientific approach, it is possible to release a captive elephant into the wild. But in Thailand we have 3,470 elephants and in captivity. and there isn't enough wild to, to let them go. I mean, the, the best figures, scientific figures coming out of, come out of India that says an, a wild elephant needs somewhere between 30 and 300 square kilometers to roam, um, depending on habitat type and all sorts of other things. And you can't generalize across from south of India to here, but they need a hell of a lot of space. And there isn't a hell of a lot of space outside the national park in Thailand. In Thailand, there are national parks that could take elephants, but the law currently states, and I've talked to people whether it's going to change, and it's not going to change, that you cannot put even um, even very high, powerful people cannot put captive elephants back into the national park, uh, partially because they are um, covered by the livestock, uh, the Beast of Burden Act 1949, so they're officially livestock. So if you put your elephant in, into a national park, you're illegally grazing your and that's the mindset of the law. Um, it doesn't make so much sense to me. There, there are so at the moment so many, so many issues with the idea of taking elephants from captivity and putting them back into the wild. I personally believe it is a good answer for some elephants, depending on being able to get hold of the wild itself.
a lot of tourists come with a really culturally imperialistic attitude about elephants. And they're like, I really love elephants and I want to have this interaction with them. But they're angry with anyone who necessitates this interaction that they want to have. You know, they want to go up and hug an elephant, but they don't want there to be anyone there who can control the elephant. We try to keep, um, we try to keep elephants and mahouts together that have been together for a long time. Sometimes the mahouts will change camps a lot, but we think if they have a good relationship with the elephant, you should do things like increase their pay to keep them together and show them that their, their relationship is valued. And a lot of camps don't do that. They'll keep the guys at minimum wage for years or less. Almost all the mahouts I've worked with are Karen. I see that they're disempowered since they don't own their own elephants. And a lot of times they are stateless or undocumented and from Burma. So if they can't stand up for themselves and they can't educate themselves, they can't really help the elephants. When elephants are born in captivity, they learn a lot from their mahouts and they learn a lot from the adult cows in the herd. You can see them from a really young age start to mimic their mom. And one of the guys trained his elephant giving it just treats, sharing his snacks with it, sunflower seeds. They're really smart. They're smarter than dogs and we train dogs with treats. So. When I first came to Chile, there was an elephant, Tongwen, and she had, a, she had a chain around one of her legs because she was close to the road where they bring in the food. And the trucks come in and drop off the food and then the mahouts bring it to the elephants. And her mahout was, I don't know, sleeping or something and she just opened the chain by herself and walked over and grabbed the food and went right back to her place like as if no one saw the elephant walk across the field. Um, when I moved to Maywang there were how many elephant camps? Like four? And now there are 15? Now there are 200 elephants in the valley? And I think that it's a lot about marketing. There's so many places advertising to them so the companies with the most money are the loudest. If a tour company is trying to make as much money as possible, then maybe they'll try to do several tours a day, up to 10, and push groups through. So that means the elephants and the mahouts don't have a time to stop and relax, cool off in the river, eat food. The mahouts just have to make the elephants go. The tour operators will complain if it's a few minutes later. One of the mahouts, one of our friends was bored to death by an elephant, and he didn't want to work with that elephant. The elephant was in heat, and everyone said he's really dangerous. One of the mahouts actually said that morning, this elephant's going to kill me. And the tour company said, don't be lazy, get out the elephant. So the guy that was the most senior mahout at the camp had to get him to work. And he was dead 20 minutes later. By him riding and working, and then second time, he had problems in here. Elephant working, come to down, and then elephant making his go down, and then he fall down, and the elephant down, making all his body is broken, and then her neck, and it almost set Paris. And no one gave a damn. The tours went on as usual the next day. Some of the mahouts that were his friends, like his family that worked together every day, weren't even allowed to finish praying for him. They had to get up and take the next group on a tour. The uh, elephant killing him, elephant run on the way for quickly. He not take care of him. He, he, he problem here, he, he doubt them. Nobody take care of him. Owner can say, go to take elephant, go to take elephant. But no care, this him already died. If the Mahouts are from Burma, they don't get anything. Yeah, you can't really criticize the companies that are doing things unethically. We've gotten death threats for a YouTube video that we made that was just about like trying to take care of the elephants better. And someone from the company came to me and said, you don't have security here and it's really dark at night. I think it's dangerous, but I don't think they want to kill me because if you want to kill someone, you don't tell them that you're going to. So it's more intimidation, but it's still really scary. There's so much money involved in the business and some people are profiting off of not treating the elephants as good as they could. You would like to hope that if the mahout is working with his own elephant, um, and in ideal situations this is still true, it doesn't always happen, that they have a greater relationship with that elephant. 
uh, we do have elephants in Mahout on site who, even if the elephant is owned by a family and three cousins have always looked after, have rotated around the elephant, they have grown up with that elephant for 20 years. And, and the whole idea of elephants and people working together works much better, especially for the elephant, if they know the person involved and you can build a relationship. Um, if you don't have that relationship, you far more often have to rely on coercion and punishment to make your elephant do what you want it to do. Ideally, you would be able to choose good mahouts, and again, you can't necessarily choose mahouts because it's an hereditary thing. Um, but ideally, if you were able to put it together, you would choose mahouts who are able to find a way to communicate with the elephant and the elephant and, and, and make that bond. Um, to answer the second part of your question, when that bond isn't there, when you put a new person on an elephant, it is extremely unlikely, apart from a few very, very exceptional mahouts that I know, that that mahout and elephant can talk to each other. 3,400 elephants in captivity in Thailand, they have to have at least 3,400 mahouts. Each mahout has a different character, each elephant has a different character, so you're in effect looking at 3,400 different character combinations, marriages if you like. Um, some people call it a bad marriage, but it's a marriage. In some cases, it could be a good marriage. It's, it's 3,400 different character combinations that have to be managed. You can't, you can't generalize, but you do have to keep in mind that unlike a marriage, one creature, unlike a marriage, one creature is vastly stronger than the other and cannot express themselves in words. So what we're doing through the target training workshop program is recognizing that all the mahouts know about positive reinforcement. They also know about the other things, but they know about positive reinforcement. But what target training does is give them a chance to use it scientifically, to, to learn that they capture, as the, the trainer says, capture the right behavior. So just in the same way as whacking an elephant on the head, the elephant doesn't understand what it did wrong. Quite often if you use positive reinforcement wrongly, if you give it the treat when it flaps its ears, as well as the same time it does what you want it to do, it thinks it's getting a treat for flapping its ears. So what target training does is it allows, it teaches the mahout to say, I want, this is the behavior I want, and this is how I ensure that the elephant knows that it's being rewarded for doing this. Luckily, target training is very, very good for something that vets all want to do, um, and elephant managers all want to do, which is foot care for the elephants. And it's also something that has never been in part of no form of any of the Southeast Asian training has designed was designed around getting an elephant to present its feet. Okay, so I'm Fina. Um, I'm the science officer and intern coordinator here at the Golden Triangle Asian Elephant Foundation. Um, my background is uh, animal behavior and conservation, so I'm really happy to to work here because they look at the bigger picture more, not help our elephants, but all the elephants or try to take well, all the elephants which is really nice um, so my task basically is train the elephant as you just saw or as you will see <laughs> <laughs> um, make sure that changes slowly over time always try to work with the mahouts to teach them no w new ways or try to remind them of different ways because some of them do understand, but they like to go back to their own way. Mm -hmm. um, so with the target training, the target training is basically having the target and uh, bringing her whatever we want, head, foot, limb, um, backside, side to the point, to the stick, um, and then she gets the positive reinforcement. Good. So I'll present the target. Target means touch with the hat. And then she, once she touches, I say good, and she gets the reward. Um, try again. Target. She touches it. Not quite on the hat, though. Target. Yeah. Good. And. And then once that's up, we could easily check the nails, the foot touch, whatever they need. So it doesn't matter. There's no rush, mm -hmm. and elephant decides. Um, 
down. Next. Good girl. So some elephants have a really short attention span. So they do it for like two minutes or they're really good in it. And then they decided not for me anymore. So if they walk off a little bit, try to look in that grass, that's totally fine with me. I will try a couple of times to get her back. And if she decides she don't, she don't want it right now, I don't force her. So it's all voluntary cooperation. So she doesn't need to do this, but she wants and she gets the treat for it. Um, if she decides, I don't, I don't know, doesn't bother me, don't need to treat, she wouldn't do it, but she let us do it. Um, so sometimes they even endure blood draw or something more painful, but they will stay here because they want to, not because we keep them here. So it's all their choice. resort in Chiang Mai, Thailand. Well, we started we started Chai Light Orchid to fund Daughters Rising. Daughters Rising is an anti-trafficking nonprofit, and we don't have any funding. It's 100% funded through our social business, the Chai Light Orchid. We have girls that learn, um, well, they come and we have a safe house if they need to just stay. We have a job training program where girls learn all the different aspects of hospitality, housekeeping, cooking, um, working in a cafe, some accounting. They also have women's empowerment workshops where they learn about everything from self-defense, Muay Thai, um, internet safety, human rights, women's rights, migrant workers' rights. Nuku is in our program at Daughters Rising and when girls graduate they have the choice to take out an interest-free loan to start their own small business or will pay for their education. But Nuku had already gone to college some, so she wanted to start her own business, and her idea was to open an elephant retirement home and rescue in her village. I want to have, like, I want to stay in the jungle. I want to work close to my village, with my family, and I want to help current people. Like, they will have a job, like, cooking, take care of elephant, cut the grass to elephant. This place creates jobs for a lot of people in the village. The village is so remote, they don't have access to um, sell anything or to go to work every day or even go to school. The people here are farming, but they're usually just farming to have enough to eat. They don't even have enough to sell if they could go to a market. I think it's different because it's really remote and authentic. It's pretty simple. The concept is we take all people's stuff away. There's no electricity, you have no signal. So you're forced to be present and interact with the humans that you came on holiday with, or maybe just like be with yourself and be in nature. And people love it. A lot of people tell us it was their best day of their trip, one of their favorite places, and that means a lot. <laughs> so we have a policy, we don't want to ever buy an elephant. We thought if we could work with camps that are working the elephants really hard and show them that there's a different way, we're helping in two ways. We're giving the elephants better quality of life and we're also showing the owners that there's a different, a different method in which they can monetize owning elephants without hurting them. So at the Chile Orchid, people can just watch elephants, feed them, bathe them in the river. These are elephants we fully retired. We still have to pay money for their food and for rent and for the guys to take care of them every month bull was in hobbles because bulls are too dangerous mm -hmm. and no one wanted to work with him. So then they just spend their life chained with their front legs chained together. And the other one was working and she had to do rides and chair rides at and a trekking camp. Blind. Yeah, which I think must be really scary for her. And if we can't continue to raise the money, then she has to go back to work. 
it's hard because the majority the majority of tourism in Thailand right now comes from China and it's a different demand. People want to have cheap interactions with elephants that are as fast as possible. They don't want to get dirty. They don't want to go in the water or get muddy. And elephants are really messy. So it's difficult to convince the owners that this is the way forward when they see tourism from with elephants from Western countries and people that want to have more ethical experience with elephants kind of declining. All of our guests find us from doing a lot of research and looking online, but it's expensive. We don't have enough money every month to be paying to put brochures. You have to pay for the stand that your brochure goes into, plus you have to pay for the printing. So for a small company, it's cost prohibitive. Elephants are really expensive. It's a challenge mm -hmm. every month. Some months, my husband and I don't take home our small Thai salary. So right now it's still month to month. If we can get more, if we can get more help or get more people to visit, we can help a lot more elephants. It's a costly um, uh, operation, but they're big animals, you know. Uh, nothing is for free, so it's 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 common. But you can find ways to generate money to care for these animals with, for example, volunteer programs like we do. When I started the foundation, people told me when I was caring for the animals, Edwin, why don't you get volunteers to help you out? And I said, well, you know, the problem is volunteers from abroad, I need to give them rooms, I get to beds, I have to feed them. It's going to cost me so much money. It'd probably be much better to hire local local staff. But then people said, well, you, you got this wrong. You know, you can have paying volunteers. I thought it was an absolute crazy idea at that time people come and work here and pay for it why would you do that but then I started looking around at other organizations all around the world and started searching on, on Google and I found out that the majority of projects had this volunteer program Thailand was a country with lots of people coming from all kind of countries over the world so the combination of helping animals and then Thailand as a country became quite successful we run a very good um, uh, program one of the cheapest ones, to be to be honest, because I want everybody to have the chance to volunteer with the animals. In our place, you could volunteer um, with wildlife, you could volunteer specifically with the elephants, and even for those people that are a bit older and don't want to be, you know, um, scooping up elephant poo every day, there is a place like the lodge we have over here to have a bit more privacy, a much better standard of rooms, like a little bit like a three, four star volunteering program as well. It's a bit more expensive, but for people that are a bit older, uh, it's usually um, a, a welcome um, difference. But it's it's basically turned into a sustainable program. So people volunteer here, pay for their volunteer time here, and uh, this basically made it possible for us to continue, increase, and make a better and better project every year. The majority of animals that we rescue are taken from uh, people as, as pets, as, as exotic pets, animals that ended up in the illegal wildlife trade and were intercepted, confiscated, and then also we have a very large part of animals that were injured in traffic, uh, electrocuted by power lines, etc. Et I think our emphasis, our, our main focus uh, of rescuing these elephants is that we do not keep any of the elephants on chains even at night. We do not lock them up in enclosures at night. Our elephants roam around 24-7 and are able to um, to uh, show uh, a natural behavior. Larger and larger enclosures like the elephants behind me here at the moment where they can walk around, they can walk in the open grass areas, they can go for a swim whenever they want or they can look for cover under the trees on, on, my, on my other side. So these elephants can choose whether they want to be in the open, in the water, they want to swim, they want to walk, they want to eat, up to them, day and night. They can make that decision themselves. Uh, also, uh, in our elephant uh, sanctuary here, we do not ride the elephants. There is some hands-on work, like showering them, and with feeding, of course, you get very close to them. But uh, we keep the, the contact to a minimum, because that's better for both people and the elephants. The daily day at a rescue center like ours is... Um, it starts in the morning around 6 o'clock, when the first uh, food is being put in their enclosures. They wander around get a bit of food here, get a bit of food over there. We don't drop it all in one place. The animal needs to exercise, walk, look for it, forage for it. In the wild, they wouldn't eat from one place. They would go around as well. We do the same here. Um, we do check their, their health. Our veterinary team every day passes by and looks at the, 
behavior of the elephants, looks at their body, at their eyes, and basically um, a general checkup every day. Um, around lunchtime, they get fed again. After lunch, some of the elephants will be, um, will be washed. This is a hands-on thing, but washing the elephants and, and being hands-on with them at least once a day actually gives us a much better idea about the general well-being of the elephant. We can actually see the skin from nearby, we can see their behavior, they got any pain, they got any trouble. Um, the elephants once a week get their special vitamin supplements as well, usually put into bananas and all kind of other food, so they'll just eat it. It's very important to get it because most of them are old ladies. The ones behind me here are all over 60 years old, so they need their vitamins and all their stuff. Yeah, at the evening they get fed again, grass put around the enclosure, enrichment, food being hidden everywhere, so they have something to do at night. And we see that most of the elephants are busy looking for these little treats until about 9, 10 o'clock. And then they um, usually spread around the enclosure and lay down. They uh, basically sleep, eat and shit. <laughs> situation in general the key thing is come and see for yourselves please do come there's a lot of oversimplification for certain audiences actually on both sides but a lot of oversimplification in the other direction which says all elephant riding is bad um, all elephant tourism interaction is bad um, funnily enough it mostly says all elephant interaction is bad except in my camp um, but that's the, the harm that that has caused is that it's leading, or has led, we've seen it happen, has led to people who would otherwise be able to have an influence on a camp such as mine, or a, and I have special markings, so I'm okay, but an influence on a, on a trekking camp to say, well, hang about, I saw your elephant was working too hard, or your mahout, he's overusing the stick, your mahout is doing this, you train your elephant too much. People who could have this influence are now no longer coming to the camps that need to improve. Um, and that's forcing owners to look for other markets who are not necessarily, the, the other markets themselves are not necessarily in a position to, uh, to exert that influence. One of the, the biggest threats of people staying away, people who would be able to affect positive change staying away from any and all elephant camps, is that they're not able to move the conversation forward. It's not the ideal situation for elephants. We want to see a thriving wild elephant population. But right now that's not a possibility. There's no place to put them in the wild. And there's a huge captive elephant population in Thailand. So there needs to be emphasis on how we can take the best care of them and improve their lives. And it's really hard for small places that aren't driven by greed, that really want to take good care of an elephant. So, I don't know, tourists can help a lot. Tourists can help the elephants if they really think about what they're spending their money on and research it. You can have the best dreams in the world, but if you don't make a plan, that dream stays a dream, and when you have a plan, it becomes a target. <laughs>